Hello, this is Dr. Stephen Jones. This first lecture on the early management thought, part one, will detail mostly some classical theorists, including those in the scientific management area. This discussion is intended nothing more than just to give you a brief background as to what early managers thought uh, managing people was all about. It definitely was not the same thing that we think people are uh, all about in the workplace today. The first spot that we should take a look at is uh, the couple of areas that we're going to look at in this short lecture. One is the classical viewpoint and two is the quantitative viewpoint. Classical viewpoint was simply how to make work more efficient. That is how to get people to do things without very much input or resources. It sounds a lot like today, but in the classical viewpoint, they were looking at people as basically hands, as machines. And so getting people to do work uh, with the least effort on the manager's part was uh, the best option. Ideas about uh, psychology and sociology were uh, barely on the horizon, so people really didn't put a lot of stock into that. They mostly thought that people worked for whatever uh, incentives you were able to give to them. The quantitative viewpoint was uh, a look at making the workplace more effective by getting the work itself done in a more effective manner. So training people, etc., would come about. Early on, some influences in management include people like Adam Smith, Robert Owen, and Charles Babbage. Now, Adam Smith we know mostly from an economic standpoint uh, because of his book, The Wealth of Nations. But it also, his quote that's given here, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker, we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. That economic viewpoint uh, was very critical to early management thought. People believed that other people worked largely and almost solely for the idea of personal gain. Now, prior to the 1800s, most people ran their own businesses. They didn't work for other people uh, in the industrial sense that we have because the industrial movement had started. The industrial movement starts largely because of the introduction of science, uh, steam engines, electricity, etc., which makes it possible to power large factories. Now, that's not to say that there weren't factories or there weren't large plantations, as we know there were. But the broad mass of humanity across the world didn't work in a factory setting. They worked instead on perhaps farms. Even if they were sharecroppers, they worked on farms. And they worked to feed their families <clears throat> And as a result, uh, they were working their own land or in their own shops making things that they would then sell. Uh, much more entrepreneurial than we are today. Robert Owen in the 1800s takes a different viewpoint of the factory uh, setting because by that time we had started having larger buildings with people in there making uh, processed goods. Um, standardized products, whether it would be from clothing or firearms or farm implements. And his viewpoint was a little bit different, uh, partially because of his religious background and, and feelings. He looked at people in the workplace as needing something more than just uh, basically a paycheck. And so he created not only a factory system for his own uh, operations, but he created towns uh, to support that. And his idea was way ahead of its time. Once, once he died, uh, his idea pretty much left out. But it was an interesting uh, foray into uh, basically socialism. Uh, long before people really had developed the concept of socialism to any major degree, long before Marx, uh, Robert Owen was coming in and creating societies that, uh, small, small societies, 
um, that worked together for each other's benefits, and basically he was looking for a utopia. Charles Babbage took a different tactic with people. Um, his idea, and again, he's looking at more of a factory system as, as work develops. He starts looking at people having the incentive to do better work and to do more work when they have some profit coming out of it besides an hourly paycheck. So for everything good that you did and for every um, every profit dollar that you put into the company's uh, coffers, then you would also get something out of it. Uh, and so we have the same kind of profit sharing and bonuses uh, today that he started up back uh, in the 1800s and 1900s. Now classical theorists, and these are people who uh, were talking about the theory of management, so they weren't doing so much uh, the, the managing themselves as Robert Owen had done. These are people who studied, and in the 1800s we get that scientific thought brought over into the business area. Scientific thought and study had been left to nature and chemistry and even war up to this point but it starts to invade into the business area and so people start researching things about the business area and how people work and why they work. Frederick Taylor is one of the first of these and inspired both the Gilbreths and Henry Gant. But Frederick Taylor, or known as the father of scientific management, decided after some failed attempts at managing people on his own, he tried some things that simply didn't work, he decided to step back and look at the workplace and introduced what we know as the piece rate uh, where you get paid for each piece that you produce and he had some concepts about the kind of person that you would choose that you would determine the kind of person that you needed for a position because of, of the job specifications and then you would look for qualifi uh, qualities or qualifications within that person that would make them proper for the position. So if you needed somebody to lift heavy bags and transport them across the factory, you needed to find in his day a man who had a lot of muscles and stamina and could lift those bags and take them where else you needed them. On the other hand, if you needed somebody with nimble fingers and good eyesight, uh, then you would choose that kind of a person. Now in his mind, that kind of a person then would be left in that job for forever because they were perfect for that kind of a position. You wouldn't consider them for a management position. That would be left to a man, again a man, uh, but that would be left to a man who had leadership qualities. And so a person who was on the factory floor would never be considered in his theory would never be considered for management possibilities or promotion because they perfectly fit the job that they were doing. Franklin Lilly and Gilbreth looked at efficiency within the workplace by using time and management studies. I mean, pardon me, time and motion studies. And so they were trying to make the workplace partially because as we'll take a look at some psychological things in the next lecture, but they were looking at it because the workplace was seen as having psychological impact on workers. You were spending eight to ten hours of your day at the workplace, and especially they were looking at factories. But they looked at this as a means of finding ways to make the workplace more hospitable. And in their ways, it was not management being more hospitable, it was making the work more hospitable. So if they found after their studies that a brick maker or brick layer or parts specialist took 25 motions to complete a task, they tried to find ways to help that person re-engineer the job to make it 20 or 15 tasks instead of 25 therefore not only increasing the speed but reducing the strain on the person 
therefore making the work, uh, the work less arduous and more enjoyable. Henry Gant wanted to create a way to make the process of management uh, more efficient from the manager's side. This is not so much from the employee's side, the, the labor side, but from the management side. And so by finding ways for managers to schedule things properly, uh, you would make the workplace more efficient because you wouldn't have uh, unused resources laying around. So take a look at the chart that you see here on this page. Well that chart is a way to schedule certain tasks and it also helps you to schedule when resources are delivered uh, either into or out of the factory. And if something's not going to be needed for three weeks, don't bring it into the workplace. That's inventory that you don't need. If you don't need somebody on the job for five weeks, don't bring them in because they'll just be standing around. So Henry Gantt can be credited with something along those lines. You may have used or seen a Gantt chart before, or you might have uh, used one even in, in school. Uh, I've seen Gantt charts where somebody would sit down and, and uh, create a chart of when certain uh, projects were due and when they needed to start work on those projects, like a research paper, and they would start charting that out and when they needed to start things. Uh, a syllabus with a timeline of activities is fairly much a Gantt chart. These are the deadlines for when things are. Uh, here's when they start. Uh, and you have a week to do them or two weeks to do them. Uh, so get started. Here's here's the process of time. That's a Gantt chart. It just looks different than it does here on the screen. Now one last thing about Lillian Gilbreth uh, before uh, we move on to the next slide. Frank and Lillian Gilbreth were husband and wife team. And Frank was much older than Lillian and uh, he died uh, relatively, well not early in their marriage, but uh, she lived on many years after he had already died. And they had 12 children. 12 children. Uh, there, you may have seen uh, the two movies uh, that uh, Steve Martin and some others were in uh, called Cheaper by the Dozen. Well, that's based on the Gilbreth's life a hundred and many years ago. But Lillian Gilbreth was interesting. She had uh, two doctoral degrees and was one of the first women in America to have a doctoral degree. And she went on after their time in motion studies to really look at psychological effects of the workplace once uh, Frank was already gone. She started looking at ergonomics and the psychological um, effect of the workplace and had her own set of work uh, long after their pairing had, uh, had ended. Scientific management, <coughs> excuse me, scientific management is based on the idea that you can create a scientific workplace, that there are certain principles and rules which can be laid down that make the workplace much more efficient and effective. So, as you can see from the points here, development of true science, scientific selection of a workman, Again, workman, not a worker. Scientific education and development, giving the person the right tools and training that they need, and cooperation between management and the men. Now, do not take intimate, friendly cooperation to be something that it's not. What uh, these people were talking about, Frederick Taylor and, and his students, basically, we're talking about when they're talking about this cooperation is that management lays down rules, workers understand those rules, the rules are fair and provide an incentive for workers to work and they are able to cooperate. This is not the development of, of uh, socialism, um, it is still capitalism, but it does recognize that managers simply cannot whip workers into shape. So, as you see the summarizations there, try to create science instead of rule of thumb. In other words, 
determine the things that you need, write down the rules, go through orderly processes, don't just do something at the spur of the moment. Harmony and cooperation instead of fighting, force, uh, and doing things simply for your own self. And then look at development of each man to greatest efficiency and prosperity. You try to develop your workers so that they would be the best workers possible. Again, not with the concept of trying to make them into management material, but rather to make them the most efficient and effective workers uh, possible, and therefore provide the incentives that they would have, largely peace rate and pay, um, or sharing, bonus sharing, etc., to make them happier on the job place. Now, other classical theorists that are out there that were not in the concept of scientific management are Henri Fell, Max Weber, Chester Bernard, Henry Ford. These are people who lead us from the 1800s through into the 1900s and talk to us about uh, concepts of administration, basically. The classical theorists were more interested in administration than they were in science. So Henri Fayol has his 14 principles of management. You may have heard of concepts like unity of command, esprit de corps, division of work. As he looks at the European workplace, he notices that he was studying governments, that the governments needed better principles out there because by and large people were getting jobs uh, because of who they knew and not because of what they could do and uh, competency. And so his 14 principles um, help the workplace to shape up, hopefully, to shape up in a way that it's, it's no longer haphazard. Max Weber, looking at similar things in the German area uh, and throughout Europe, looks at bureaucracies and red tape and tries to find structures that work better so that he has uh, scope of management reduce instead of trying to to manage a hundred or two hundred people you try to manage smaller amounts have more managers Henry Ford starts up in the early part of the 19th uh, 1900s uh, with his automobile production and created factory lines based on Vail and Weber's principles and he also used some of the principles that uh, uh, you found with the scientific management community. So his attempts were to reduce uh, the number of things that any one worker would do uh, to reduce the size of, of management scope out there to make his factories run more efficiently. Now, because of what Henry Ford did, he created jobs that were very specific and very technical, but they were also very boring you would put on five specific bolts, you might do this on to 1,000 car chassis coming through in, in a day's period of time, but you only had to do those five bolts, so you could do those five bolts very well. You didn't do anything else but those five bolts all day long. Now that caused a real uproar with his factory people, there was a huge amount of turnover because after a while that is extremely mind-numbing work and so people weren't paying attention to the work, there were a lot of workplace accidents, people were drinking too much, sometimes on the job, and he had a real problem with it. His solution to it was not to change the job, but to up the pay. He started paying, he doubled his, his workers' salaries at one point to get them to stay on the job. They'd been making about two and a half dollars a day for their work, he up there paid a five bucks a day just to make them want to stay on the job. It didn't make the job any better, but the incentive to be there was that much better. And again, remember, we're talking in the teens, the 20s, and the 30s of the 1900s. So that was very, very good money, uh, but it was a very structured workplace. Then if you look at the work of Chester Bernard, who was later in the 1900s, um, he's looking at a way to create a workplace 
that still uses excellent administration, but now looking from a management standpoint, he wants to make organizations uh, more efficient at the management level, and therefore that would bring us into uh, a better workplace for employees as well. So overall, classical theorists, the scientific managers consider that scientific pro principles are important, laborers, uh, laborers need to be compensated and compensated well, uh, and standardize and train. You look at what people need to do, give them the skills to be able to do it, and you'll have a more efficient and effective workplace. Make sure that the incentives are there and people will do their job. Those are not bad principles. Those are true in the workplace, even in the American workplace. They're not the only thing that you need to consider, but they are good principles that still work out. If you want somebody to be able to do their job, they need to know how to do it, they need to know why to do it, they need to have a concept of what's in it for them. From the administrative management, we pick up the concepts of creating an organizational structure and management within that that makes it possible for employees to do their jobs. And so you have a well-structured organization. You have places within the organization for people to be, uh, functions for them to perform, good rules for people to follow, and you don't worry about the concept of hierarchy because it's a, a positive thing. You know who your boss is, you know who your boss's boss is, and who your boss's boss is. And that's not a bad thing because then you understand the chain of command and that's what hierarchy is all about. As we move into the 1920s, from the 1800s into the early part of the 20th century, we see a an American workplace that is becoming much more like what was being seen in Europe during the 1800s, although a bit cleaner in some ways and a lot more technological, we see factories sprouting up by the 1920s and they are large masses of humanity with some management over it. They're not making extremely complex products, but they are sometimes using very technical machines. And as you see here, this is a, a set of telephone operators uh, with a, a, a supervisor, and they're using what we would now consider to be crude machinery, but that was very technologically advanced at the time, uh, for the increasing telecommunications network that was starting to sprout up through the early parts of the 20th century. This is the end of part one.